Yeah, so welcome to our talk, Functional Programming and the Web, Front End Development. Um, just uh, about the two of us. My name is Michael Park, Johann Ludwig Franken. We are from Symbolium, uh, founded uh, 2015 in Berlin. And if you want to know more about us and the company, outside is our uh, desk, so you're welcome to join and talk with us. Um, when I start talking about PureScript, um, I don't want to just shed light on the language itself, but um, what you also heard in the morning in the in Elise's uh, keynote. So uh, we will have a look at the language, we will have a look at the tooling and the ecosystem of PureScript, <coughs> we will have a look at the community of PureScript, and in the end we will talk about our experience that we have made in our company, or personally with the language and with developing like commercial grade application in PureScript. So all these are factors if you think about changing your web front end development from JavaScript to PureScript maybe, there's all things that you can factor in. So if I, if you have like a short question, you can interrupt me at any time. If you want to ask something more complicated, I would ask you to um, wait until the end. Okay? So the language. Uh, about the language, in short, history and orders. Um, we have Phil Freeman, Gary Burgess, and John A. De Bruce. Um, two of those guys work at Slam Data. That's also the one notable company that has all the front end in PureScript. They do a no SQL visual analysis. So, yeah. If you want to have a look at how, it's, how it looks, you can visit their website. PureScript is a relatively young language. It's been in development for only three years, and it's pretty much, I'd say, like between alpha and beta. So, um, yeah, active development. The project structure, um, PureScript project, consists of the compiler itself and an interactive wrapper. Like people familiar with Haskell will know the compiler and the interactive environment. You have PSE bundle, that's a kind of a linker that links all the compiled PureScript together to one big JavaScript library. Um, document generation, um, markdown for humans, and then publish for the Pursuit API search engine. Uh, I will give you an example of Pursuit later on in the slides. Uh, this is basically something like Google or Hadoop, where you can search by type or by function, by symbol name or by package. You have a PSC hierarchy that's uh, really nice actually. Um, graphical documentation for all the type classes in a project. Um, the whole project is implemented in Haskell and the compilation target is JavaScript. Um, language properties of PureScript, it's purely functional. Um, it has a strong static type system and it compares. I, as I just said, it compiles to human readable JavaScript. Um, and well, <clears throat> the outstanding feature is actually a standalone output, meaning uh, that you don't need any JavaScript runtime. So you can use the compiled output as is in your JavaScript application or website. Or whatever. Um, <coughs> if you have heard the talk about L, maybe they have need of a runtime or GHCJS, they use the runtime, so they have just play JavaScript. Um, maybe I can jump quick over that one. There are two examples of um, how PureScript, the PureScript compiler generates code. <coughs> the first example is an increment function over some functor. So anyone who is not familiar with this notation, please interrupt me. But as you can see in PureScript, it's the first part you write increment is map plus one. And the generated JavaScript uh, looks like this. The type classes are realized as a dictionary. So you look up the, uh, the type class and you get the, well, the instance method is then retrieved from the dictionary. Map is a prelude function and you see how this double application works. So this is the carrying mechanism of PureScript. It actually generates uh, a function that returns a function in JavaScript. And then the innermost function is just the addition. 
Um, there's the monadic code. This becomes a little more complex here. So uh, we, uh, this is a hello world program. So you just, uh, in, in the main function, um, you bind a new stref, something like an IO ref in Haskell, um, or an st ref, and uh, put some string in there, read it back, and write it to the console. Okay. Um, and this is the generated JavaScript code. We have a do, this is a special function in script. Um, the stref is bound to a variable with a scope here. And then the bind operation, again, is a method of this present dictionary. And then it's the application is, you can see it in the order in which the application takes place. <coughs> so it's still human readable. Yes. Short question. Yes. Um, the or zero in the first example in the generated code is that written? Uh, to make sure that it's yes, exactly. This is um, like this constraint, let's say, is uh, from JavaScript. So if you want to make sure that the type is actually inferred as a number in JavaScript, you write or zero. Or if you want an empty dictionary, you write like or and these braces open and closed. <coughs> okay, some language properties of PureScript. Um, as you have seen already, the design promises a smooth <coughs> transition for anyone who knows Haskell. Um, we have a similar type class hierarchy. I mean, there are differences, but the ideas of type classes, we have that one. We have, um, I have um, as an example, I've given the type class of uh, org, uh, where you can see that actually the, the precondition is the same, so it needs uh, an equality. And it needs to be um, have an instance of equality, and then it can be have an ordering. And actually, this looks really similar to Haskell. Um, you have similar abstractions and control structures in PureScript, as an example, monads and effects, applicatives, functors, all these nice abstractions you can do, use right out of the box. Um, the syntax is actually really similar, as you've seen in the in the slide before. So we have a pattern matching in pure script. We have do notation. Um, we have this structure of, of modules. Um, your data types are defined as sum and product types, as, are, as in Haskell. Um, we have new types and type aliases. And even some of the language keywords are exactly the same. <clears throat> also the type annotations here, uh, this is the monadic lift. Um, you can understand the type signature right out of the box if you know Haskell, um, and the implementation as well. No more questions. But um, more interesting maybe the differences. So the first um, batch of differences is in the syntax. We don't have um, tuple syntax in um, in TrueScript. We don't have. Uh, Cons patterns. I mean, PureScript used to have these cons patterns, but not anymore, sadly. But an interesting feature is this role polymorphism in records. Um, I just jump through the example. Cons patterns is if you dissolve, uh, um, let's say, a cons list, like in Haskell would be X, um, double quotes, uh, Xs. This is a, like with the, the pattern with the con list constructor. So and you can write x, doppelpunkt, y, doppelpunkt, z, doppelpunkt, z. This is this comes pattern. That's not possible in script. Oh, for, for Bitcoin or, or it's just for Bitcoin. Other data types have normal patterns. Yes, yes, yes. Just the natural patterns. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> um, and um, okay. The row polymorphism, um, that first there's a function show person, which matches <coughs> any uh, element of a record for first and last, and generates a string. <coughs> so uh, we define a record that has exactly those <coughs> attributes, first and last. Show person one, person one works as expected, but, <coughs> I'm sorry, uh, on the fly, defining another record with uh, that is of a different type, um, still show person of that record um, has the same output. 
Um, and the notable difference is the record access. You can access these elements with, with the JavaScript, um, this object dot notation person one dot last. Uh, function composition in PureScript has another operator. <clears throat> the type system in, uh, in PureScript is quite different from Haskell. Um, as you have maybe seen before, you need an explicit for all. Uh, you have named instances. Um, if you say like um, my data type is instance of the order, like the order type class, so you need to put a label on this instance. Um, and this then maybe the interesting part are these extensible effects. So we uh, this is a like the type of signature of a main function um, with okay return type is unit and it's uh, part of the F monad, this effect for monad. And all what you can see here, uh, these are the, the effects that uh, are part of this main function. So for example, the canvas, random exception, st with another state with another type, and DOM effects. So the names are arbitrary, so you have to put a label on these uh, effect tags as well. They don't mean anything, and then or any other effect. So these are, this is still ex extensible, this list. Uh, which means that you can, in the same monad, um, F monad, you can interleave actions with different effects. And it all gets evaluated uh, properly. This is something where the uh, Haskell's I.O. monad is much too powerful, <coughs> and this effect system is really fine-grained. Let's say, which effect does this have in the F monad? Mm. Then, of course, there are some differences that are based uh, in the JavaScript world. Um, PureScript is evaluated by a JavaScript engine, V8 or SpiderMonkey, and there are some, some implications to that. First, it's evaluated strictly, you don't have concurrency, and the performance characteristics of the generated code have yeah, big variation. Um, so if you, if you know this from optimizing JavaScript to some specific engine implementation, the same holds for JavaScript. Mm, package splits are really cheap. Um, when pulling in the dependencies with any front-end build system is cheap as well. So we have, a, as a consequence, a minimal prelude. It's only 730 lines of code. And highly specialized packages. If you know the, the Haskell base package which encompasses all like here either or maybe or different data types, these are all separate packages in PureScript. And then as a last example, I want to show you how the FFI is working. The FFI of PureScript goes into the JavaScript world. So these two samples are taken from, um, from different files. This is a, the second one is a JavaScript file, a module which exports a JavaScript implementation of web stream concatenation. And this one would go into the PureScript module, the first one, where you just import this function and give the appropriate type signature. So then you have on the PureScript side your type safe. Good. Um, yeah, let me give a short overview over the ecosystem then. Um, just the basics first. How do you build a pure script project? Um, you use, for any front-end developer, it's maybe familiar with um, Node, the Node Package Manager, and with Bower, this dependency management tool, um, and you use the pure script compiler together with <coughs> And any build system that you might like, you could use Grunt, you can use Pulp, or you can use Gulp. Yeah. You? <laughs> yeah. <coughs> All of those are, you can build a the project with it. Uh, so this is actually no really no obstacle, and the workflow is the same as for any other front-end development. But and this is maybe important if you think about switching. At the moment, there's still very little compiler optimizations. I, as an example, I put you have tail call optimization in the pure script compiler and dead code elimination. But uh, you don't have inlining and you don't have um, like partial and total application of function calls. 
and this really hurts JavaScript performance because as you've seen before, um, having all these curried functions like function returns a function returns a function, this really these are actual calls in the JavaScript machine. And um, as an optimization, you could detect when a function is called with all arguments applied. So uh, PureScript still does not do that. And um, yeah, the consequence if you implement the same thing in plain JavaScript, you will uh, notice um, like a gain in performance. Okay, uh, the pursuit search engine looks like this. <clears throat> An example search here is map. So anyone who uses Google or Rainbow should be familiar with this. Um, so you can, you, you can search this symbol, you can search for these modules, you can search packages, so the pure script prelude, or you can search type signatures. So it's something that really aids your development and it's really good in, to have something like this in an early phase of the language. Mm -hmm. There are frameworks as well. This, um, I won't go through all the code now. It's just as an example or a reference if you want to have a look at the code later. Um, Thermite is a wrapper for React.js. Um, and here you can see how uh, well, some HTML template is built from a list. Uh, this is not like a builder monad, it's just a list that gets uh, applied and concatenated. Um, you, have, uh, you can specify um, like here these links, these are all links. With this, um, you have a data type there that's uh, title and gist. This creates all the links and just render out the whole template, which is really well for them. <coughs> and uh, well, a little more powerful is uh, Halogen. <coughs> it's, a, it's a native PureScript implementation. Um, and it's a type safe declarative UI library. So you can do your um, UI for your website completely in Hamilton. It's actually really nice. <coughs> And the idea is like, I, I won't go through this code either, but just in short, you have a state type, and then you have some input types, <coughs> and then uh, this is the uh, the definition of the template with the events. So here you can, this one click for example, you can tell if some HTML element is clicked or activated or whatever, uh, what should happen. And this, in, in consequence, we have an eval function that changes depending on the type of input, changes your state. Actually, um, the last thing, Lambda Cube 3D. Uh, which is also like a really nice project. It's uh, a WebGL rendering backend that's using PureScript. And um, you have a purely functional DSL for defining uh, yeah, the whole 3D scene actually from like the geometry to shader code to animations. Um, and this is taken from the website. So this is a live demo. You just manipulate the code over there and get instant results here. This is what you can do with PureScript. Um, in conclusion, the, uh, on the ecosystem, we have um, a really wide and diverse ecosystem at the moment for such a relatively young language. And the ecosystem is really fast growing. There's a lot of active development. So for anyone who wants to experiment and get involved there, I highly recommend trying out PureScript. Um, and also, if you have done front-end web development in JavaScript only, and you need fresh ideas or ways to do things, also check out PureScript because of yeah, well, of the, the type system and the, the purely functional approach to web code. Something more, yeah, the community. <clears throat> Why do I talk about the community at all? Um, well, the populace of any languages ecosystem is the community um, and its structure, characteristics and well, the people involved in the language, they directly influence the way the language is used or developed, is moving further. So when you choose, do I want this language to be part of my like commercial development process, you should have a look at the community, get to know the people, um, because they can either be a great help or an obstacle. So uh, this can always happen and uh, 
I put here, this is no intention to judge the people involved with any community. It's just something that you have to keep in mind for your development process because you need to adapt to the community and you should not have false expectations. So it's better to get to know the people first. <clears throat> the PureScript community is actually tiny at the moment. Um, I've checked the, the GitHub commits and there's just four individuals that have two thirds of all commits. So there's more people involved, like 30, 40, but they only one commit or bug fix. So actually, it's all hanging on four people. The same people are responsible for the majority of all the PureScript packages available. <clears throat> the consequence to this is communication is tightened. Um, communication runs in closed circles. Um, or one on one because the people know each other or work together. Um, and compared to the Haskell community, you don't have an open debate at the moment. Um, features or improvements, changes are in the Haskell community are much more widely discussed than with PureScript at the moment. So if you see where these discussions take place, it's uh, in GitHub's issue tracker or on the IRC channel. And that's not really a good way if you want to keep up with the debate or discussion itself. <clears throat> Some consequences of those were that um, hasty decisions were made regarding the language design and uh, you don't have any prioritization at the moment. So if you have some pressing issue, it's not guaranteed that the community or someone else will address this at the moment. So maybe you have to get involved yourself. Um, what are examples of hasty or pressure decisions in your community? Mm -hmm. If I can just move okay. to the next slide, I, have, I, I will give some examples. Examples? Uh, <laughs> explicit imports. Um, this was done for, I don't know why, but uh, in, in the import statement, you have to specify uh, not only the symbol name, but is it a class, is it an instance, what is it, and be always explicit, and you could not import a module completely or re-export it again. Currently, it only warns if you do it, but the yes. fear that it gets forbidden completely. So this is uh, something that I put here. They implemented it, then there was protest, then they refought the thing and put it, okay, let's put it on warning status, and now they're just shrugging it off. I think it will just go away, but... Yeah. Okay, the removal of cons patterns. Uh, I already addressed that. We had cons patterns in PureScript. Um, yeah, in a language that boasts pattern matching but they have been removed for some, really for me, this reason was not... Uh, well, the reason was that the standard uh, data type is an array, so you have bad performance if you do use cons pattern as an array instead of a list. But the, the natural consequences uh, would have been to add cons pattern to lists and not to remove it from arrays because uh, I... Yeah, but this is something that, where debate is actually missing because you can try out that, try out that, compare and discuss. So this didn't happen. <clears throat> um, the type class hierarchy has been uh, restructured. Um, I will have to uh, speed up a little. Um, and orphan instances have been banned completely. And the prelude itself um, has been refactored and, the API, and its API has been changed. So all these changes to PureScript, the language, um, are not just like in the periphery, they are at the language's core. And this is what you get to do. Um, maybe we can move over to your part because we don't have so much time there. Okay, uh, I just wanted to talk about the ugly, the bad, and the good, but uh, for the sake of the argument, just the good, uh, the community. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I want to. Uh, <laughs> so, um, in the community, you have a big sense of familiarity. Uh, because of this, everybody involved really puts in a lot of effort. It's not that uh, you have an issue that's open for a month, somebody addresses it then. Uh, PureScript advances at a fast, fast pace at the moment. It's, it's really interesting to follow this development. And they have excellent learning resources. For such a small community and such a young language, you have this pursuit API search. You have a really great book on PureScript, a learning PureScript written by Phil Freeman. So there's huge time and effort in, in this, um, yeah, so you can really count on the community in that way. And then, 
for the fourth section, let me just pass the mic to you. Uh, okay, I talk about experience, that's one chapter. Maybe that's because of my age, I don't know why I've done this. Uh, well, uh, I have uh, a lot of experiences with GUI programming in Haskell, and that's uh, actually a mixed blessing. We have all this nice research libraries, and if you want to do really practical stuff, uh, well, I fall back to using GTK to Haskell for many years, and that was really a pain to deliver it on different platforms and to uh, work with it. So I, I'm the author as well of Lexa, this uh, Haskell IDE, so that was a pain to uh, you know, provide for Windows and Mac and all this. And as well, I was uh, working in, in industry, uh, maybe uh, or <coughs> mainly in two areas, uh, in uh, banking and in transportation area. So I did use Haskell for quite, a year, quite some years in industry. And if you deliver software there and it has no GUI, the engineers actually ask, and where is your software? So um, it's a nice point. GUI is not needed, but it's not always uh, that what you really want or what you want to use. So uh, I had this uh, uh, need to do GUI code, and at some point it was clear that uh, the best solution would be to use a browser in, uh, as a GUI. And uh, of course there uh, was then uh, a lot of effort to have some functional solution for this. And uh, I still think that uh, it will be in the future to have this uh, browser-based GUIs and you don't need to do anything else in the long run. So uh, it was like autumn last year that we then decided for uh, the solution to go. And we, I started first with L, but it was uh, what we did uh, was a WebGL, not a, a typical GUI, but uh, we, we had an OpenGL software in uh, ESCO and we tried to port it to, uh, to the browser, to run the browser with WebGL. And I started with L, it has a nice WebGL binding, but it, uh, it was kind of incomplete, and it was, you know, uh, beautiful and nice and clean, but uh, somehow something missing, and that was uh, uh, why I then switched to JavaScript. And this time, GHCJS uh, was simply too difficult to install for me. Um, now it has uh, much uh, uh, has done a um, great evolution. So maybe it would be uh, it have been the, the right way to go. And as well, Idris has a JavaScript backend. So maybe that would have been the right uh, way to go to switch to Idris. But I was not aware of this. Uh, so we uh, came to the pure script language. And this uh, science here is a uh, size of the community, uh, maybe. It's not any other judgment. So what we then did, uh, pure script came without the web shear binding. So we took the uh, IDL from Konus and wrote a Haskell script to generate the low-level binding code, which was very easy. Then we wrote a higher level above this, which mainly is there for having more type safety and some convenient stuff. And the only real magic is that uh, you define the binding to the GPO uh, with, uh, on the pure script type level so that you are then type safe inside of PureScript. Um, if, you do, if you don't do it right, well, it will crash. So you are, it's your responsibility that you do the right type definition. And then you see, oh, we need vectors, matrices, and all this stuff, and we wrote some uh, quick implementation just for what you needed, because, you know, 
to do it right, we would still be busy with this. And then we uh, took some examples from learningwebgl.com and ported them from JavaScript to PureScript to see if our binding would work and work. And you saw it was uh, slow, like a factor two uh, slower. And we did all the optimization we could with ST arrays or reps uh, on the vector matrix and so on. Didn't help much. So um, that's actually our problem in the moment. Okay, and we did some a while tip like having a global WebGL context variable because it was much much uh, quicker than always have windows.webgl or something like this. So we are very pragmatic and want our software to run and uh, yeah, the beauty is not everything. So what's then our experience with uh, PureScript? It has a stable Time checker and uh, code generator. Well, we found some bugs, but that was always quick to fix. <coughs> and the extens an extensible record system is really a, a blessing, you know. <coughs> so, I guess so that's a downside of the Haskell community. I don't know. Uh, I think now it's coming, but this, this, this system is really good. And the effect system, well, it has had some problems, but it is uh, really uh, nice as well to use. And uh, plus is the generated code, as you see, is uh, transparent, and you can see what happens there. You can debug it on this level or profile it on this level, and it really says something to you. And uh, in time we use it, the uh, error messages have uh, so uh, the pain was uh, the, a lot of breaking changes. This is 0.7 release, and we have all the pain to you know um, change our code a lot, and it was not better after. And uh, yes. Uh, Michael already told it, there's a tendency in the community to say, ah, that is the right way, and we copy it the other way. You have to use explicit imports. So implicit are not so good. So maybe, but maybe it's better to give the freedom. So I have long years experience working, for example, in object-oriented programming, and one time there was a tool that if you you wrote a method with, with more than five lines, you get a warning. So, yeah, maybe it's not, not so good so to be so strict. And uh, what we are suffering is this bad runtime performance. And uh, the greatest problem is nav, native, naive, currying, so that everything gets closer, 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 closer. And for example, this uh, Google Chrome uh, JavaScript engine, it's not like, doesn't like it. <laughs> I have hoped it's a little bit better, but it's really a lot of garbage and time that's wasted here. And I think it would be quite uh, easy to find a solution for this, but it's uh, not attacked yet by the community. And we have no time at the moment. Uh, no inlining and as well the pipe class approach is uh, as well like you always have a dictionary and look up the dictionary and that takes time and uh, I'm sure you could optimize it if you're a smart guy. So maybe I skip this as well. Yes, uh, I mean, it has been said before, the ecosystem, and we simply use it. In addition, I personally use the Atom editor now because it fits with JavaScript as well, and it has a pure script IDE plugin that helps with it. And no, the pure script IDE is an Atom package, and something is wrong with me. But you can edit. To 
Okay, the product we will, we will show it uh, here at 4 o'clock in the coffee break. So if you are interested, we, we can show you the product. And uh, so maybe we have <coughs> questions and answers or right JavaScript interface is really totally easy because you have no special uh, special contracts or so uh, special um, constructs uh, in QScript that you have to use. So it's really absolutely easy to write your JavaScript code and integrate it. Uh, in the first versions we used, it was possible just to write it in the same file. Now they forbid this. You have to write another file, but. But still, if you're talking, for example, about uh, jQuery, there's, there's already bindings for PureScript, so you just have the PureScript jQuery package, and you can use all the features of jQuery. I was thinking more of like React components. Yeah, yeah, there's this uh, this framework. You have like a low-level FFI wrapper for React JS, and you have this framework uh, Thermite that's also on the slides. Um, that's uh, like a nice abstraction to it. Thin, but really nice for using in a time safe way. You can, you can easily match uh, pure, uh, React components written in PureScript and React components written in JavaScript. It's no problem. There's no, the runtime representation is the same, so there's no problem at all. So, are you using Thermite? Are you using this framework, Thermite, Thermite, how you pronounce it? Uh, we ourselves, at our company, we don't use Thermite. I have personally, I don't have the experience with it, so. Give the tutorial. Oh. Yes, yes uh, there will be, <laughs> there will be a, the drop in replacement for Matthias later. And he has prepared some hands on pure script, so anyone interested in getting their hands on pure script, uh, we will walk through some code and uh, toy around a little. And he's chosen the halogen framework that's this, uh, yeah, this UI library. That's stable. Okay. What do you do the kind of performance uh, degradation that you saw with um, your Well, maybe it'd be really nice if the community and somebody uh, that implements some optimization steps in the PureScript compiling, or if we have enough time, we will do it ourselves. Right? I mean, we are swamped at the moment, um, but it's something that's on our agenda, and if nobody else does it, uh, yeah. We have to do it on our yeah. So your problem is that the raw execution time of the of the generated uh, JavaScript code that begins in your product. That is exactly. actually important. Yes. Okay. Yeah. <coughs> in your comparison table of the, of the function languages compared to JavaScript, how is it using JavaScript? Is there a reason for that? Like why do you use it for the or yeah, it was just a personal decision at this time and uh, I just uh, Listed what I know. I mean, there was some more like hay or haste, or I came from the Haskell world, so I look for yeah, so that's, that's, uh, what Jürgen said before. We had the prototype implemented in Haskell with an OpenGL backend. It was like to make porting the code like almost one to one. So we looked at something that was similar to Haskell. Uh, yeah. Is there some clever trick to synchronize the data definition? Yes, but that's actually not a trick. Uh, you just write it the same. So you have, if you have a Haskell data type and you want to get wow. this, if you want to uh, get data like an AJAX request, and um, you deser like you serialize this data type with ASON on the Haskell side, and you have an, uh, an instance of a type class is foreign on PureScript. This means you can pass the JSON, uh, and then you have the exact same data type. Uh, as an oh, any more questions? <laughs> <laughs> you, can, you can follow up and talk to you later. And there's the product demonstration at 4 o'clock yes. in here. So if you're interested, all right, take a look. So thanks again, Thank for the applause.